Hello, data science people. Welcome to anyone out there. Feels like it's been a while since I've been streaming, so glad to be back here doing it. Doing it live on the internet, as the saying goes. Let me know how the mic levels are, how the sound levels are. Uh, Want to keep the sound quality good, so I appreciate the feedback. My name is Carl. I am a data scientist and I am streaming live from Silicon Valley, California, where it is a cold and foggy Saturday afternoon. <laughs> kind of typical summer weather for us already in May. Very foggy. But today I'm going to be talking to you not about the weather. We're going to be talking data. I'm going to talk about churn prediction with demographics and firmographics, which is a pretty cool and useful topic if you're in this world of data science and churn prediction. If you haven't seen my streams before, I should tell you that I always play music. I've been working on the sound levels and filtering, so hopefully there's a good audio experience now. Also, I always talk a bunch at the start of my streams before I get into uh, actual data and data science and stuff. So I like to level set, kind of like explain to everyone, you know, sorry about that, <laughs> something going on down there. I like to level set, explain to anyone, everyone what area of data science I'm gonna be talking about. So without further ado, I'll dive right in. I usually start with answering the question, what is churn? Churn means that your subscribers, followers, or users quit or unsubscribe or cancel or unfollow, which is basically what you don't want them to be doing. Uh, the term churn comes from the churn rate, which is a metric for how many customers are quitting in a given time period, typically a month or a year. But churn is not just a rate, churn is now also a verb. You can say the customer churned or I am churning from Hulu or Netflix because I'm sick of it and I want to spend more time watching Twitch. <laughs> or you can churn from your favorite Twitch uh, streamer who you subscribe to. Um, <laughs> you can't churn from me because you probably haven't subscribed to me. <laughs> Although I guess I, I, for me, I would define churn as unfollowing. Strangely, Twitch doesn't tell you about your churn rate. They tell me my new followers, but not my churned followers. I don't know how I can get that information. If anyone does, let me know. Anyway, churn can also be a noun. You can say, make a churn report or make a report of last quarter's churns. Or you can even say, this customer is a churn because they canceled their contract. They said they were gonna churn and now they're, they are a churn. <laughs> anyway, that's all churn lingo if you're in the business. What is fighting churn with data? That is the book that I wrote about fighting churn, uh, based on my experience as chief data scientist at a company called Zuora, which you probably never heard of, but they're well known in the software as a service industry as the, they coined the term subscription economy, we did at Zora. Um, I did a lot of great work there and wrote a book about some of my experiences as featured here. Uh, also, there's a 40% off discount coupon. The book is kind of pricey. Don't blame me for that. You know, the publisher decides that sort of thing, the pricing and marketing and stuff. They price high, but then give a lot of discount. So if you want to get it from the publisher, there's your discount code. But if you're watching my stream, you probably don't even need to read the book because all the code is available to you for free, as I'll tell you in a minute. And with the stream, you'll learn all about, you know, how the code works. So you could go bookless, and I encourage you to do that if you like to learn from video, as many people do nowadays. Why might you want to learn about this? I'll just say really briefly, churn is the most common data science problem in the world today because so many companies, all companies now have a churn problem because everyone's got recurring revenue. They want their customers coming back. But it's a little bit different from a lot of other data science problems. 
Also, the way I teach it is a great way to learn data science foundations, which is kind of what today's stream is more about. A lot of data science foundations. Now, data-driven churn reduction is the goal of all of this effort. It's not just a Kaggle contest where you want to get a high churn prediction accuracy. So I teach from the point of view of not the maximum accuracy, but the maximum usefulness in actual churn reduction. So how do people actually reduce churn? Well, make a great product and your customers won't churn. How's that for an idea? Uh, and you can use your data to figure out what features and content your customers really love. So there's the data tie-in. You can do marketing, which is like a targeted engagement to your existing customers and use your data again to target the right message to the right customers so you're not just spamming people. You know, that's definitely the best way to get the best marketing result. And you can also do help your customers with support or training, which is the job of the customer success department. And again, use your data to figure out what customers need help so you don't waste training effort on customers that don't need help. And lastly, you can fix your sales and pricing. So you want to right size your pricing and plan so that customers get a value without you giving out discounts because that undermines your pricing, uh, pricing strategy. So data is good for all these things and that's what we're trying to do. If you haven't noticed, I'm listening to like a chill hop uh, stream save channel on Spotify. If you're with me last stream, you, I was trying out pretzel rocks and I got sick of that thing posting in my chat channel. I hope some of you out there will post in the chat channel so I'm no, I know I'm not alone, but I understand if you're lurking. I do that all the time. So let me get into the real content now that we got the pretty good chill hop going in the background. If you want to follow along with all the code that I'm about to do, this is where you get the code. It is my GitHub repo, Carl24k fight churn. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. <laughs> Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. There you go. That's a good secret. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. I hope you could hear the lyrics in that song because that's a good one. So give yourself a present today and you can clone this repo. <laughs> I don't know if that's much of a present, but if you want to follow along with the code, this is how you do it. So you install Postgres in Python and then you run a data simulation to get the data that we're going to work on. Because the truth is companies won't give out their churn data for people to learn on generally. Um, but I provide a simulation that makes very realistic data to learn about churn. So let's see, what will you see? Where is the data? Let's finally look at some real data here. Let me go to my database query tool here. And I have set my search path to um, my schema. Your, if you download the book, yours will be SocialNet 7, but you can make other schemas to work on. So the basic data for churn in this context is subscriptions. So let's look at subscriptions. So there's a table of subscription records that correspond to accounts. You can see here there's an account ID column. And this tells you when the subscriptions start and stop. So that's how you know when people churn. And this data will all be created by the simulation. But what are we gonna to analyze to tell if people churn or don't churn? Or, you know, how are we gonna actually do all those good churn reducing tactics? I am not very eloquent today. There's also an account table that goes with this data, which provides more information about the accounts. So here you can see these additional fields about accounts. Um, I'm going to tell you more about these in just a few minutes, but this every account has a channel, uh, a date of birth, and a country. So those are the things we know about our accounts. And those are actually the demographics which are going to be the subject of today's stream. But this isn't all we know um, about accounts. There is also a table of events which corresponds to what the people did on the, the, the product 
which is kind of the most important thing. Now this doesn't tell you too much because it just, you can see that events have, are for an account with an account ID. They all happen at one time and they have an event type ID. Now that's not very informative. So let's see, there's also an event type table. Maybe I'll go back and use a saved query. I think I did this, you know, in the past. If I just go back a few queries, <laughs> I can show you more easily. Here's a query I'm looking for. This is, a, is joining the event table with the event type table, which has the names of the events. Whoops. Can't leave any of your SQLs selected or thinks that's what you're trying to execute. Okay, now we can see the event type, the event table contains events that are like posts, replies, likes, dislikes, ad views. So what's going on here? It's a social network. So all this data is about users of a social network. Uh, and the event table contains the time and time stamped events for each account. And that is basically a lot of the basis of churn analysis. This is the data that you use to analyze, to find out what are your good product features, bad product features, uh, and what your customers are interested in or good at or having trouble with. So that's all very important. Um, that's the event table. But let's see, don't forget also, today we are talking about the account table. So we'll come back to this one in just a minute. Hello, Ken Pafu, welcome to the stream. Hope you like the music. And if you get it, if you feel like chatting, tell me where you're from and what's your interest in data science. And I will continue back to the regular content. Hey, why is my chat not showing up? What the heck? Hmm, I see the chat. There is a problem because our chat should be showing up in the recorded stream, which is not. I'm sorry for this. I think I'm gonna blame this on the Streamlabs uh, OBS upgrade that we just got. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not seeing the chat on the recorded screen. Hold on a second. I really apologize for this. I'm gonna try to do a quick hot fix of my stream desktop. Where is the chat box? Put back in the chat box. Hmm, whoops, no, that's not what I wanna do. Streamlabs OBS for dummies, I'm sorry. <sighs> All I want to do is have the chat appear for you. There it goes. Hey, Ken Vafu, you're from Southern California. <clears throat> Ooh, hockey analytics, <clears throat> sports. So you're self-learning, that's cool. Well, if you have a, any kind of background in math or statistics or computer programming, this will be definitely something you can self-learn about. And I'm glad I got the chat showing up again just in time <laughs> so it can show up on the screen. So I hope that effort was worth it. Oh, you worked in the film industry for a while. <clears throat> cool. I actually lived in Southern California for a while. I'm a big nerd, I went to Caltech, which is down in Pasadena, as you may know. So anyway, I'm the, now that I got the chat working and I showed you some of the data, let's go back to the program. I remind myself what I'm doing by having a slide deck. <laughs> Keeps me going in the right direction so that we actually get somewhere in this stream. So we had all those metrics and all that data about you know who subscribed and when, and that was already turned into a data set in my previous streams. So this is hopefully, you know, you could have seen this before on previous streams. Uh, these are all the customer metrics or features of the data set, like per month, 
new friend per month, post per month. Those kind of metrics count the behaviors of the customers so you can have a summary of what each customer is doing rather than the individual events we were just looking at. Is churn 5%? That's the churn variable in the data set. In fact, I can show you the data set, see what it looks like. This is the data set you would get if you had been following along. Showing the data here in Microsoft Excel, which is actually a fairly convenient data viewer. Uh, you can easily, you know, make it look big enough to show on a, stre a streaming screen for one thing. So in this data set, we have a column for who churned and who didn't. And as you can see, not that many people are churning. You don't even see any churns in the first row, the first screen full. Here's one down here. Because remember, our churn rate is 5% in this simulation. So then for each customer, we also know the channel that they bought on or they're, work, they're using the app through. Uh, it says App Store 1 and App Store 2. That's kind of like a you know, stand-in for the two app stores without naming them by name or the web. We also know the country of the customer and the customer's age, apparently to very high precision. <laughs> uh, these are those metrics I was talking about, like per month, new friend per month. So the way this works is each row of the data set represents one customer at one time, one point in time given by this observation date, and whether or not they churned, and then all these other metrics about them. So that's kind of the background. This is all in earlier streams, if you haven't seen this before. So having had that, this is a, the data set, and here this is a summary of the, the behavioral metrics, as I would describe them. Today, we're gonna to talk about demographics and firmographics, which I was referring to. These are facts about people, but not um, about their behavior. You're slowly trying to catch up and you are recommended your st my stream recently. Wow, someone actually recommended my stream? Wow, I can't believe it. That's good. I'm glad someone likes it. Cause you know, as an independent live streamer who just does this as a hobby, sometimes you're like, why the heck am I doing this? But hearing things like that actually make it all worth it. So today we're talking about using, and so sorry, Ken Puffu also, you should realize that you're kind of coming in at the end of the entire series. Uh, I'm in chapter 10 of the book right now, so I'm near the end. This is like the last subject in the book, actually. Um, and I've been streaming through the book for several months. Um, I am going to review the earlier chapter topics again in the future, but not uh, immediately. But anyway, so right now we're talking about using facts about your customers. And you can see all these great examples here in the stream, in the screen, things like the date of birth for a person or equivalently for a company, it could be the founding date, um, the sales channel that the customer bought on, uh, where they live or where the company is based. These are what we call demographics or firmographics. And they're different from the event-based behavioral metrics because, well, they don't really change that much for one thing, uh, that's important. So the, the sales channel or the place of residence may change occasionally, but very rarely. Um, whereas behavioral metrics can be expected to change much more commonly. Also, what the other difference that you might be noticing is that the behavioral metrics, like we were talking about on this slide, are all numbers. These are all real valued. The number of likes, the number of new friends, or ratios or measurements of different things are all real valued. But our demographics and firmographics, as you can see, are maybe dates. They might be strings also, if it's just a, you know, a description of something. And also you could have a few Boolean values mixed in there. You might have a few numbers mixed in with your demographics too. And we'll look at uh, all this more. I'm still in the talking phase of my stream. We'll get into the, the hacking and coding phase in a few minutes. So last stream, we looked at churn cohorts on demographics, which means dividing each demographic group into a cohort and analyzing the churn rate. Um, and we did this with numeric demographics, just like we do it for metrics. You group people together based on the similar values of the numeric uh, feature or measurement. 
For date demographics, we saw in the last stream, you convert it to a, num a number by subtracting off some reference date so that your date variable turns into a numeric variable. And that is why, as you might have noticed, in the data set, we have the customer age <laughs> to a very high level of precision. <laughs> Let's see if I can like make that a little bit more compact. There we go. So in the data set, we have the customer age, but as you might have recall, in the database, we have the date of birth. So how do we do that? We will take a look at that in just a minute. But moving back through this, now the other type of demographic were what we call categories, and those are the strings. Um, and they're hard to analyze in cohorts because you don't have an order of the categories that helps you understand it. Um, you, don't, you also don't have a guarantee that all your categories have the same number of people in it, which also can be a pain. But we kind of went over how to handle that this all last stream. That's actually also, well, it says at the top, last stream. <laughs> And also you don't have a prior expectation about which category will be best for churn, meaning the least churn, or which will be the worst for churn, meaning the most churn. Whereas with behaviors, usually you have a pretty good expectation that people who use your product more are gonna churn less. That's almost always the case, that the people who use the product the most churn the least. So it's kind of easier to analyze behavioral metrics. But, what are we gonna to do today? We are catching up. Okay, we're gonna look at category churn cohorts and, and do some of them. Let's do it. We'll get into some code straight away, or finally, it's not straight away. So we're gonna look at how to make a, 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 a churn rate analysis and categories, and we'll go through it pretty quick because I did do it on the last stream. This will be, whoops, this will be kind of a review. All right, so this is how we it. I've already got a breakpoint here and I'm going to find the right configuration for this, hopefully. Did I save it last time? I have a lot of configurations, obviously. Oh, there we go. Ch category cohorts. I told you I did this last stream. <laughs> I'm not crazy. So what are we doing here? This is listening to, let's do version one first. And yeah, chapter 10, listing to version one. This is how the, the, the listings from the book are described. And you'll find them in this structure uh, in the repository on GitHub. So to analyze the churn rate in each category, first we're gonna do the channel, the sales channel. Hopefully we'll hit my break point any moment now. Here we go. So I'm gonna go through this kind of quick. So we'll go, hmm, still not hitting the break point. What's happening? There we go, finally. Python took a minute to wake up there. It's having a brain freeze. So the first thing that we do is load the data. I went through the details of this last week. So I'm just gonna kind of run that one line and then I'll prove to you that this is the data using the handy PyCharm debugger. And we can look and see, whoops, hey, not so handy. There it goes. All right, so this shows that this is the data set I showed you a few minutes ago. I've turned the customer, customer ID and the date into the index column. A pandas data frame has an index. Uh, the is churn variable field, which is the outcome of who churned or not, is in the second column. And then we have that channel, which is what we're gonna analyze for the churn rate. Uh, and then there's all the other fields in the data set, but we don't need to go into all that. Just proving to you that this is a real data set here. And as you can see, it has around 25,000 rows and 20, 20 columns. I'm pointing to right here where you can see that, hopefully, if the screen is big enough for you. Now we'll actually do the analysis to find out you know, the churn rate in each category. And we're gonna do it using this helper function. And really we're gonna do it with pandas group by. Uh, which is a great trick to use on a data frame. The column uh, is the, here I'll show you get these variables. So the column is channels, that's the category column, cat call for short. 
and then we use group by the category column and then this dictionary tells it what to aggregate in the group by. It's going to do counts and the number of churns, the sum and the mean um, for the channel column. Uh, and then I use this also to calculate what I, we call confidence intervals. And I went into confidence intervals in painful detail last stream. Actually, it wasn't that painful. I kind of just gave a hand-waving overview, but maybe to some it was painful. So we're going to calculate confidence intervals too and put these all into um, a data frame somewhere. So now I've created this summary data frame kind of quickly. I, like I said, I'm going through this quick because I did it all last stream. So for each channel now, I've count, counted the number of customers in it, um, how many churned, and what the average churn rate in that channel is. Um, so you can kind of already see the result here. Um, and also what percentage of customers are from each channel and low and high confidence bounds. And it was really done with these uh, pandas aggregations um, up the group by an aggregation function, which, like I said, I'm not going into detail today because we really did this last week. So this is the kind of the end. The rest of this is just making a plot, which I'm just going to run. And then we can look at the result here. This is the, the plot that we just made. And this shows you the result for the channels. Um, so you can see that App Store 2 has the lowest churn rate, less than 4% on average. App Store 1 is a little bit higher and the web has, has the highest churn rate. And this is an example of a churn category analysis. And I want to show you this because we're gonna see this all again. Remember, web has the highest churn rate, App Store 2 has the lowest. These bars show the confidence bounds, which in this case suggests that the category is pretty significant. We're gonna do one more example real quick by going back into the code and running version two, which is for the country category. This time I'm just gonna run it and then we'll look at the result. And I'm doing this, this is really analytics. This isn't prediction or forecasting yet, but I'm doing the analytics first because it'll make more sense when we see the result in the prediction later, having seen you know, these analytic results. So now this is the churn rate analysis of cohorts for the country variable. And in this case, there's a big range of average churn rates from the different countries, but you notice the error bars are really large also relative to the average. So these error bars are pretty much all overlapping. And what that suggests is that these differences in the churn rate are not that significant. Um, they, they, you know, they may look like a big difference. Uh, this is like 7% compared to 3%. But these very large error bars suggest that there's so much variability in each country that, you know, it might not be true that this is a significant, significant difference. And so this is what we did in the last stream. Um, and this is prep for what comes next. Moving on to new stuff in this stream. Yes, finally, the new material has arrived after half an hour of streaming. That's the way my streams go though. Gotta build it up to new material. What do you think of this song? Coffee and cigarettes, hmm. <laughs> Those are nice things, but I gave up smoking myself, so. Still take the coffee. Anyway, we wanna use demographics in our predictions. Predictive algorithms are like machine learning algorithms or statistical algorithms. And we're gonna look at both today. So categorical data is string or Boolean, um, but how, are we, how do we use it in a machine learning algorithm that takes numeric inputs? <laughs> oh, you like the songs, but you don't drink coffee or smoke, Ken Fafu. Well, you're that's good in some respects. Although, do you know that coffee is good for you? 
Moderate coffee consumption reduces all causes of death, is what I've read. Cigarettes, not so much. And I gave up cigarettes a long time ago myself. So do give up smoking if you do it. There's my anti-smoking plug. <laughs> oh, and this song is Coffee Lover. This is a good one too, right? We're going on a nice, uh, nice tip on the, the coffee songs. All right, so what were we talking about? Okay, we wanna use our categories. Ah, tea, yes, I'm actually drinking tea today. I am also a tea drinker. At the moment, I'm drinking tea. But I, yeah, alternate coffee tea depending on my mood and tiredness level. Usually I get a pretty good buzz from streaming. And if I have coffee, then I'll just be like bouncing too much. So anyway, back to the data science. To use demographic data in predictions, you have to convert it to numeric data. And it's helpful that your categories have this property, or they should have this property, mutually exhaustive, collectively, mutually exclusive, sorry, collectively exhaustive. So that means for something like the channel of a customer, which is, if you don't know that term, it's how they buy your product or how they use your product. Um, every customer has to have one and only one channel. So the channels are mutually exclusive. And the list of channels are collectively exhaustive in the sense that they list all the possibilities. You've got App Store 1, App Store 2, and Web, and those are all the possibilities for channel. Now, what we're gonna do is convert the binary, uh, convert the category to a binary numeric value. Um, and this is called dummy variables. It's also called one-hot encoding. If you're a computer scientist or engineer, you might have heard of one-hot encoding because they made that up from some wiring technology. Literally, back in the day, there would be like one-hot wire. So they called it one-hot encoding. Um, statistics, statisticians call it dummy variables. And I prefer the term dummy variables just because... What we're doing is closer to statistics than uh, wiring. And also I'm pretty sure the term dummy variables came first. Like it probably goes back to like the 19th century or something, I'm uh, not quite sure. Any statistics buffs out there know when the term dummy variables goes back to? Well, I won't bore you with Googling it, but let's actually get to the code and see how we're gonna make dummy variables from our categorical variables. It looks like we're gonna do it with a new code listing from the book. Let's see, let's go to 10.4. First I'll open it up. Let's see, here we are in chapter 10. There is a listing called dummy variables. As you can see, I like to call it dummy variables. Um, I'll make a new configuration. If you haven't seen PyCharm configurations, the easiest way to make a new one is to copy an old one. That's always true. Whoops. But it helps if you do it, if you press the right uh, button for that. So let's call this one dummy variables. And let's do it. Actually, making dummy variables may sound complicated. Like if you look at the picture I just put out, you might think you have to do some thinking, but actually we're just gonna do it using um, an easy function from pandas. So pandas, if you don't know, if you're new to Python and data science, is the, panda, is the Python package that handles tables of data with like a name in each column. Basically, a pandas data frame is like an Excel spreadsheet or a SQL table, if you're familiar with what those are. So, we are gonna make dummy variables for this data set. And as I mentioned before, um, we read the data into a data frame, show it to you again. So we have the, the column for channel and country, and those are the ones that we're gonna be working on for dummy variables. Now, there's an option to group the columns, which I covered in the last stream, um, and I'm not gonna cover it now. 
<laughs> but I think we were, did we group? What did we group here? Oh, we grouped the country variable. Okay, that we covered in the last column. So the countries get grouped into regions. And then we're going to make the dummy variables. And it's actually very easy. We just do this one function, get dummies from pandas. So pandas really takes care of everything for you. You thought I was gonna teach you an algorithm, but I'm just teaching you <laughs> um, to call a pandas function. Now, if we look at the data, let's see what we got. Hmm. We have more columns, if you notice. Before we had 20 columns, now there's 28 columns. And if we view it as a data frame, you know what happened? You see how the channel and the country columns disappeared. They were, they were right after the churn column before. Where did they go? They went all the way to the end here. So now we have channel columns for channel app store one, channel app store two, and channel web. That's and there's also a column for channel non, not a number or not available. And then similarly for the countries, well, the countries were grouped into regions already. Oh, wow, thanks Ken Perfu. According to the internet, the inventor of dummy, dummy variables was George Boole, okay, in the mid 19th century. Okay, I was right, it was 19th century. I did not know it was George Boole. Hmm. A book on the investigation of the laws of thought hmm, on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities 1854 he proposes 0 and 1 as a mean to represent a class okay well that goes back before they had electricity so I'm gonna go with dummy variables as the original term and not one hot encoding thanks very much um, so these are the dummy variables for this case. And in this case, in the country group, there's also a, not a number and there should be some countries that are, that are, that are not available. If you noticed in the original data, I can show you back in the data set, there are cases of missing countries shown here. There are no cases of missing channels, it turns out. But anyway, so this is what we get out of using the get dummies function. So now we have the data set with um, the dummy variables. And now I'm gonna do some extra manipulations that'll prepare the data for the other things we're gonna be doing later on in the stream. So the new columns are going to, are the, the ones we added for the dummy variables. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out which ones they are using a set operation where I'm gonna look at the set difference from the dummy data column and the raw data columns, right? So now this gives me a list of the new columns here, which you can see. Like I said, they all start, they're prepended the name of the original column that contained the category. And then the category value is the post fix or post pended. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, so that's what, and, and get dummies does that for you. So this is a great function. I've really seen people write this themselves, which is bad news. You don't want to write this yourselves. Um, here I'm also going to find out what are the category columns for me to keep track of. And I'm now going to make a data frame of just the new columns. And we're going to analyze this in just a few minutes. So this dummy call DF, Well, it has only, this is only the, wait, that's not the right one. This is the list of the columns. What we're gonna do is make a, a set of data. Um, let's see. Well, first we're gonna save one uh, that is all the data with the dummies for analyzing with XGBoost. Um, actually, what I did here I'm trying to remember what all this code does. Sorry for the halting explanation. I should have reviewed this. This is saving a list of the dummy variables in a small data frame. So this is just a list of what are the dummy variables. And we're gonna need this later, so trust me. This is not a, a data frame of the data, it's just of the dummies. 
Uh, what IDE am I using? I am using PyCharm, which you can see here. And it is free, which is a very good thing about it. And it is also independent, which is another good thing about it. Uh, you can pay for PyCharm too, like a professional edition. I've always used the community edition myself. JetBrains is the maker. So what we're gonna do is now, that we saved off a little list of what are the dummy variables. Now we're gonna save multiple versions of the data set that we're gonna analyze in slightly different ways. One for XGBoost, one for a statistical analysis of just the dummy variables, and one for a statistical analysis of all the, the numeric data together. Hey, Tarua, Katerina, you made it back. Thank you for joining me again and welcome. Hope you like chill hop for the day because I'm hitting all the chill hop essentials. I'm back to uh, Spotify uh, copyright free music, by the way. Pretzel Rocks wasn't working for me last time. I like to keep my chat for uh, chatting and not for the advertisement of Pretzel Rocks. Anyway, the first thing I'm going to do is save the data with the dummy variables. Um, and I'm calling it XGB dummies because we're going to use this version for XGBoost. It has all the numeric fields plus the dummies. Next, I'm going to make a data frame of only dummies. And I'm calling it only dummies. And I'm doing this with the column selection operation on the data frame. So this new calls variable, as you can see when it highlights, is a list of all the new columns. And now this new data frame only has the dummy variable columns. But as you can see, it still has the same index, right? Because we made this from the other data frame. So each row is still the same customer and date observation. And then the columns are what they had for each dummy variable. Now note, I've also included the churn column because we're going to really analyze this for churn later. Okay, so we save that one. Save dummy variable only data set. Here I print out these little helpful messages. <laughs> if you if you consider this helpful. Why is it showing that little Python terminal down there? Anyway, let's go back to the debugger. Next, we're also going to save a data um, without the categories. <clears throat> so this is the taking the original data set um, and I'm actually dropping the category columns. So now it's only the, the numeric metrics, right? Because we started out with those string columns and we want to get rid of them. I won't bother showing you this. Um, that's actually not that interesting. So now we've saved these versions of the data set. So, like I said, three different versions we saved. I think I list them here. And we're going to use them to do three different analyses uh, on the demographic data now. So we're going to do a logistic regression on category dummy variables alone. And we save that data set here. We can actually see where I saved them all in my folder here. So I have the dummies only data set, which you can maybe kind of see in this picture. Eh, you can't really see too much. The dummies only data set, and then the logistic regression on combined category dummies and behavioral data. And then lastly, we're going to do an XGBoost model on combined category dummies plus behavioral data. Now, the thing to note is that when we do behavioral data in logistic regression, we're going to do this dimension reduction, which you'll see more about in just a few minutes. And when we do XGBoost, if you know how this machine learning algorithm works, we don't do dimension reduction. So that's why there's actually different versions of this. So we have a big to-do list of analyses for the rest of this stream. So I think this stream might go over my usual, you know, one and a half to two hours, but let's just start going and we'll see how long it takes to do these three different analyses. But I'm going to keep coming back to this slide to remind us all what we're doing. And for anyone who, you know, sees this in the middle, you can like 
fast forward. All right, we're gonna do logistic regression on category dummies alone. And we're gonna do two things. First, we're gonna cross validate to find out the best regression model for this data set. Then we'll analyze the results. So to cross validate, this is again, something I did in a previous stream. Uh, it's chapter nine, listing five to cross validate a, a logistic regression model. And we're gonna use version two, which is set up to do this particular data set. So let's see, I'm gonna to go to listing nine, five, cross validate. I'm gonna show this pretty quickly because if you watched my earlier streams, you've already seen this. Let's see, do I have a, boy, let's see. Do I have a configuration for this one? It doesn't look like it, but I can copy this one. This is close, because this is chapter nine, listing four. Let's do chapter nine, listing five, <clears throat> version two for this uh, data set. Schema social net two, right. Okay. In the debugger, okay. We're gonna skip going into the prepare data details function, but I'll show you briefly that the X variable has our data as far as, you know, I said this was the category dummies data set, and here it is. And the Y has the outcomes, which is, you know, who churned or didn't. To do this, Cross validation, you split the data into training and test sets. So for that, I use a time series split. I explained more about that also in the stream where I originally introduced this. So I'm not gonna go into details, but I'll say very briefly, usually churn is a dynamic phenomenon in the real world. So it's good to respect time and causality when you analyze it. And using a time series split will do that. I'm gonna use <clears throat> two different models uh, two different rather scoring functions, I should say, lift and the AUC to measure the accuracy. Sorry there. Um, and then we will create a logistic regression model. Uh, this is from sklearn logistic regression, as you can see up here, from sklearn linear model import logistic regression. I'm defining this, the C parameter is the only parameter to test for logistic regression, and that controls whether variables should be cut or kept, how much you allow weak variables to stay in. And that's really what we're turning, we're, we're tuning, I should say. And finally, I create the grid search CV object, which will actually do the grid search. So let's, I'm gonna show the console also here so we can see the output uh, when we do the, the fitting. Whoops, where are we? There we go. Let's, let me just run through the rest of this now. It's starting to do the cross validation and it, I think it just finished. Yep, that was it. <laughs> So it's very quick to cross validate a logistic regression. And remember this for later, you know, when we cross validate an XGBoost model, it's gonna take a lot longer. And the last part of this function is that I make a plot, but since I reviewed the plot in a previous stream and we have a bunch of analyses to do today, um, we're going to, you know, just, I'm just gonna let this run out and it should have saved a plot. Now let's look at the plot that it made. And if you saw my previous streams on logistic regression, you saw how to interpret these, but I'm gonna go over it again. This is the plot we just made. And this is the result of doing cross validation on the dummy variable only categorical data set. So what you're seeing on the X axis is different variables of the C parameter. The higher the C parameter, the more coefficients or weights that we keep in the model. Well, let's look at the bottom plot first. This is the number of weights that we keep. So at the start, at the highest C parameter, we have all the dummy variables. And then as we lower the C parameter, we lower the number of dummy variables that we keep until at the very end, it must just crash. <laughs> 
And it looks like on the top plot here, we're showing the AUC accuracy and we're seeing a little decrease in the accuracy beginning around 0.16. It looks like it's getting a little bit worse. Um, and up at 0 0.64, 0 0.32, although it's not, honestly, it's not really getting that much lower until you get down to, you know, 0.04. But I guess in this case, we could use like 0.16 for the C parameter. Cause as I explained in the stream on uh, tuning logistic regression models, you want to reduce the number of weights or variables that you include while not hurting the accuracy. And at the very beginning, this accuracy, the loss of accuracy is very slight. We can actually look at the data for this too. Here's the, the actual result uh, in a little table for that cross-validation. And scrolling over to the part with the AUC, this is the average test AUC shown here. As you may recall, um, an AUC of 0.5 is as bad as it can get, random guessing. So here, yeah, it starts out at 0.547 when it has all these, but it's really hardly going down until I guess around I'll say when the C parameter is down to uh, 0.08. So I'll take 0.16 as my level where the accuracy has really not budged, but I've gone from seven to five you know, features. Maybe we could go to four features because it doesn't really seem to hurt. Okay, so we'll go to, I'm gonna adopt the C parameter 0.08 as the value, as the, we'll call that the best value um, which is a little bit of a judgment call, you know, based on we want to reduce the number of metrics, but not too much. Okay, so that was the cross validation. So we can cross off cross validation off the list if anyone's trying to keep track of what step we're up to. Next, we're going to analyze the results by looking at the, the regression at our final chosen value of the C parameter. So I'm going to use listing 9.4 version 4. And let's check real quick. Um, actually, this one I never edited. This was cross-validate now. And this is the, the one we're going to use next. I said we want version 4 here. Let's take a look and, and confirm what that one is. All the versions for listings in fighting churn with data refer to configurations in this file. It's a JSON file in the comp folder. And it's organized by chapter, so it's not too hard to find your way around. So if I go to chapter nine, listing 9.4, version four has data set path, the dummies one, Oh, and this one says actually C parameter 0.32. Hmm. It's advising use parameter 0.32. I didn't really like that one because it didn't remove enough variables, but. All right, I'm going to compromise and edit it to go with 0.16. So these are judgment calls you have to make when you're doing data science. <laughs> Where to draw the line. So now we'll go into listing 9.4 and we can, I can briefly re review how we run the regression analysis. <clears throat> Sorry for that. So this is regression where we've set the value of the C parameter. And I just set it in the configuration as you saw. So now it's 0.16. do the usual data preparation. Now I create a logistic regression object and instead of doing a cross validation, I just fit it, um, which is the easy part. <clears throat> now I also, I'm gonna save some further summaries of the data. I can go show you really quick. I calculate something called the one standard deviation impact of each formula, which is easy to do with a regression. Um, the one standard deviation impact is how much difference it makes for a customer who is one standard deviation above 
the average, which is like the baseline in logistic regression. I'm not gonna go into too much details on this now because I really went into detail on this in an old stream uh, like a month ago or six weeks ago. Um, the other things that we put in here are what's called the coefficients. I also call them the weights of the regression. And we're gonna save all of this out and then we're gonna look at it. Um, I'm also saving the regression model, which is a binary pickle file which can be reloaded later to do forecasting on new data. And we'll save the model pickle. Again, I'm not going into detail because I did this all in previous streams. Lastly, it'll save some predictions on the, the current data set of the churn rate. Um, so we call the predict proba function, very good function to know for sklearn models, if you don't know it, this is how you get the probability output from a classifier model. Surprisingly, a lot of data scientists, like I interview on the job, don't know this one. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, I'm interviewing someone and asking them, oh, and something about the probability of prediction, or we're doing a, a, a pair coding exercise. And I'm like, you don't know predict proba? So this is a good one to know. <laughs> but I'm not gonna go into detail either, because this is all in a previous stream. So let's just, that's the end of that listing. Let's look at the results, which is what we're actually, we're actually gonna do live analysis now. So by looking at the summary file, I'll actually see how much difference um, those variables make in terms of churn. So this is also saved in a little uh, CSV file, which again, I've opened up in Microsoft Excel. So, the weight is the regression coefficient column, or you know how it's a it's a measure of how much this metric contributes to the likelihood of churn. And what we're seeing here is that uh, to the likelihood of retention. Actually, I said that backwards. That's really bad. This is contributing to the likelihood of retaining the customer. Um, so that's why I just highlighted green is good and red is bad. So here we can see that the regression finds that the apps, the channel App Store 2 has the most weight and channel App Store 1 has the least. These other channels get zero. Um, and in terms of the impact on retention, these, uh, this makes basically a 2% increase in the retention rate if you're in App Store 2 channel, or a 1.5% increase in the retention rate if you're in the App Store 1 channel. Now let's compare that to the analytics we did earlier in the stream. Not this one, and not this one. We want this one. Let me get rid of some of these. This was our analytic exercise on the channels. And now this is actually agreeing with the regression, which is why I showed you the analytics earlier in the stream. So the, here we can see that this channel boosts his retention by 2.4% over the baseline, but the web channel got nothing. So that's like the baseline. So yeah, that's about the, the difference we see between web and app store too a 2.5% roughly reduction in the churn rate. This is quoted as an increase in the retention rate. And then also a significant benefit for App Store 1 also, which is we're seeing here. App Store 1 is also less churn rate than the web. So that analysis with logistic regression really agreed with the analytics analysis, dude. Oh, hey, Detox Mango, welcome back to the stream. How's it going? Nice to see familiar names coming back and saying hi on the chat. Now let's look at the country groups. These apparently had very low weight. These are all 0.01. Several of the country groups got zero, uh, got zeroed out by the regression. And these other ones have comparatively very weak weight. These only make maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.3% difference in the retention rate which is corresponding to the weaker influence we saw for countries um, in this analytic analysis. Well, I can find you the group analysis also. You can see we're looking at country groups, APAC, Europe, Latin America. 
That should just be right down here because we just did it last week. Let's see, is this the country group analysis? Hmm, now I can't find it, of course. This is the churn. All right, well, I can't find the country group analysis and I don't want to go into it too much more. But this is the what I basically wanted to show you. This is what you get when you analyze the data set with only dummy variables. So there are no behavioral variables here at all. And that's what we're gonna get to next. I do like this chill hop free, uh, copyright free music channel on Spotify. It's feeling kind of mellow today. I didn't want to go with the hardcore uh, BPM dance track, so <laughs> we're doing chill hop. But anyway, so we finished logistic regression on category dummies alone. Cross that one off the list. Now we're gonna do logistic regression on combined category dummies and behavioral data. Now, this one is actually a slightly more complicated analysis with more steps. We first have to prepare the metric data, uh, which is the non-category data for this analysis. And I need to do it again because I created a new data set with the categories. Um, I did it previously in older streams, if you watch them. And that preparation is converting to scores, which is a normalization or standardization of the data. And then also we reduce the dimension by merging correlated metrics together. After we've done that, we recombine the metric data with the category dummies. Then we go through those same two steps again, cross validate, run the regression and analyze the results. So. We have a long to-do list. I will have at it. So first, to prepare the churn data, fortunately, there's a combination uh, listing which does all the preparation in one code. Yeah, sure, Detox Mango, you wanna ask a quant question. I assume you mean financial uh, analysis type of quant, although I haven't considered myself a quant for like seven years, I guess. I've been a data scientist and not a quant, but as long as it's not a hard question about option pricing, let, let's have at it. And I'll start to go to listing 8.1, which is the data preparation. I better close some of these old listings too. It's getting a little bit cluttered here. Let's see, let's go to listing 8.1. This might be a little bit too mellow, this music. Okay, so this is a combined prepare data listing. You calculate stats. <clears throat> Ooh, some interesting people. TH3R1Z, difference between a quant and a data scientist. That's a, a good question. A quant is someone who works in finance or Wall Street, and they use math and statistics to understand financial data. And there's a lot of special techniques only for finance, like option pricing, uh, alpha models, which is a, a model of risk adjusted return. So there's a lot of things that are very specific to finance, but what quants and data scientists have in common is they use statistics and they write code. Another difference is that Data scientists are more likely to use machine learning and quants are more likely to use statistics. That was true when I was a quant. I think quants might be changing and getting into machine learning more nowadays, but. And salutation from Switzerland and thank you for book and Twitch video. Okay, Tixie 2020, welcome to the stream. I'm glad you liked the book and you are up really late in Switzerland. Did you just get back from a bar or something and now you're streaming data science or no, maybe no, we're not going out to bars anymore. We're, it's, we're in a pandemic, so never mind that. <laughs> and Detox Mango, what kind of metrics or signals did I follow? Well, I didn't follow um, stocks, so you probably wouldn't be interested in the metrics or signals that I followed. I followed bonds, which are kind of boring and don't have a lot of rapid price movements. Um, so we followed signals based on interest rates, 
change it, the, the slope of the interest rate curve and credit spreads of different corporate sectors relative to treasury sectors, credit spreads between different countries. Those were, those were all the kind of signals I followed when I was a quant, because I was a fixed income quant, which means I did bonds, not stocks. And bonds are harder to get into. So I think I've, I've run down the chat. So now let me go back to preparing the data or we'll never get through all the analyses I'm supposed to do today. So I need to run listing 8.1 prepared data and I'm looking if I have one already written for it. I guess not. It's always just easier to make a duplicate. I said it was supposed to be V3, right? So we need to do listing eight, uh, one version three, I think is what I said. Let's check that configuration again. Checking the configuration, make sure I'm running the right version. Chapter eight, listing one. This should be version three should be for Data set three, no cat, that's right, because this is the version where I took the categories out. All right, let's go through the listing. I'll just briefly remind you what this does, because I went into this in gory details in previous streams again. So, data set stats will save out a file. Whoops, looks like I had a breakpoint in it, but I'm gonna just step out of this. It saves out a file summarizing things like the mean, the standard deviation, and the skew of the columns in the data set. Fat tail scores turns the data into scores, which is, uh, look, I have a breakpoint in here too, but I also don't wanna show you this one. I have breakpoints everywhere because I've been streaming all this. So fat tail scores turns it into scores, which is like grading on a curve. So you take the raw metrics and convert them to a small range centered around zero, also called normalization or standardization. Then we find groups in the data using correlation analysis, also done in gory detail in a previous stream. Wow, we're, I've got a breakpoint in every function here. <laughs> breakpoint, more breakpoints in the correlation analysis. Let's get out. And then finally, we apply the metric groups, which is the dimension reduction of the data set. And I, we can show, I'll show you these results in just a sec. And lastly, creating a correlation matrix. Man, I had a break point in every single function. So what have I just done? I'll show you this in the order that I look at it personally. Um, first, I calculated summary stats, which is this table here. So I know the mean standard deviation and the skew of all my data. Let's close these up actually as I go through them. I don't need to save this either. Don't need to save the cross validation of the logistic regression. This was my original data set, I'll remind you. And I, Calculate, I did an analysis of the correlation of the variables and I calculated a loading matrix shown here, which is going to group together the first three metrics in an average sense and also group together the second, the rather the fourth and fifth metrics, messages and replies, and the rest of the metrics are kept independent. So after a result of all this, I have a new data set, which looks like this. For the first five metrics, I now have two groups. Metric group one, metric group two. And then for all the other metrics, that's the dimension reduction part. So I, co I collapsed five metrics into two. Uh, and then for all the other metrics, they're now normalized scores or standardized, whatever you want to call it, with a zero average and a one standard deviation. And these are all the standard steps you do before you do a logistic regression. 
And I went into them in, like I said, gory, gory detail uh, in previous streams. <laughs> uh, so we're just going through it quickly now. And that completes the preparation of the data for uh, logistic regression. Now I have a prepared dimension reduced data set and I need to combine it back with the category dummies. So that's going to be this next step. Combine metric data with category dummies. Now you may be wondering, why don't I dimension, reduce the dimension of the categories with correlation groups? Are you wondering that? Because I just said that I reduced the metrics with a correlation analysis. And there's a good reason for this. It's that categories within a demographic field are negatively correlated with each other. And that is due to the mutually exclusive property that I mentioned earlier. Remember, each category, like a channel or a country, has to be mutually exclusive of the others. So they have a negative correlation. So grouping them together by correlation doesn't really make sense. In fact, using correlation analysis for binary variables just doesn't make sense in general either. But we're going to do it anyway. Um, I mentioned it's better to group categories in other ways using your, pri your prior knowledge. <clears throat> but I want to demonstrate to you this point about the negative correlation between category dummies because it's quite interesting. So we're going to look at the correlation matrix listing uh, 6.2 and do a version for category the category analysis. Let's see. Oh look, I already have a configuration for the correlation, but I want to do a version, shoot, what version did I just say? Version three. All right, hopefully that's the right one. <clears throat> and let's see. Let's see, I'm going to look for the right uh, I want to make sure I've got a breakpoint in this one. I stepped through, I went through all those other ones so fast. I'll show you another listing. Okay, this is the correlation analysis for the data set. This will be very easy. As usual, we load the data from a CSV. Uh oh, I'm crashing. Hmm. Why am I crashing? No data set, no such file associated to data set three group score. Hmm, did I not run this yet? Oh no, we have to do this later. <clears throat> okay, first, I'm gonna stop this. First, let's do the next listing. Sorry, I think I got these a little bit out of order. Sorry, we have to do this one first. This is gonna merge the dummies with the group scores back together, so I'm sorry. First, remember I said, well, Remember I said we have to uh, combine metric data with category dummies? Let's do that step first, and then we'll go back and look at the correlations that I was talking about. So to listing 10.5, which is a new one, it's some pretty simple mechanics um, on the dummy variables and the metrics. configuration for list chapter 10 listing 5 no version for this one so here I'm remember I separately had the category dummy variables and then I did all that analysis on the metric groups and all I'm going to do now is put them back together in one data set. So this is called merge group dummies, groups and dummies. So the group data that we got from preparing the data, that means the dimension reduced data and the, um, the dummies. So this is the dummies uh, that we're going to load. And then this is the, the grouped dimension reduced metrics. So if I look at the dummies data frame, it's this one. We have the index of the accounts and the dates, and we have all the category dummies. 
And the group data frame is the one I was just showing you in Excel a minute ago. With the groups for the first five metrics and then the other metrics as usual. And again, note the same index, the same accounts uh, and dates. Now, really all I do here is call the merge function. This is actually a pandas one-liner. I call the merge function um, from the group DF, which is the numeric data, I merge it with the dummy data and I'm using the index and left index and right index means that for the join condition, it's looking for a merge on the two, in the two data frame indices which I demonstrated to you were the same. Well, at least I showed you that they look the same. <laughs> we didn't really go through it. But anyway, that's really all there is to it. So I merge them together. Now I have one big data frame that has all of them together. It actually doesn't look that much different from the data frame we started out with earlier, which had the uh, metrics and categories, but now we've got groups for the first metrics. All the other metrics are converted to normalized scores, and when we get to the categories, they're all dummy variables. So this is the final data frame we're going to use for the logistic regression analysis. Um, and what else do we do in this listing? Saving the merge group dummies, these are saving some helper files um, that just kind of like, the code is expecting these summary files for later. So let's just do that. Now let's go back and try looking at the correlation bit of the metrics in that new file. So we were gonna do the correlation analysis. This is the one that didn't work a minute ago. And our data set path should here be data set three group score. Oh, I hope this is the right one. I think it should work now. All right, so now we've got the data. We actually do have data, which should be the one that I just showed you. Now to do the correlation analysis, I just call the correlation function on the data frame. It's actually that simple. Data frame has a correlation function that you can call. Now I have a correlation matrix and I'm going to save it and we'll look at it in the saved form. So I wanted to make this point about the correlation between categories. That's what we were trying to look at here. So I've now saved a correlation matrix for the data set. Okay, one thing we noticed is that this one, this NAND channel was useless. So I'll just delete that one because all the channels were good. So now if you've never seen a correlation matrix before, this is, well, this is what they look like. Um, I'm going to format it and highlight it to make it easier for you to read it. Okay, just about ready. I think this is, one of, this is one of the easiest ways to explore a correlation matrix, to look at it um, in Excel with the, the, the column, the label scroll locked. So what I wanted to show you is if you look at these three dummy variables for the channels, which are shown right here, whoops, I wanted to wrap the text, you can see the negative correlations that I was talking about. So channel one is negative seven one correlated with the web channel and minus four eight correlated with the app store channel. So these are the negative correlations between categories in the same group that I was talking about. You can see the same thing over here in the group of metrics or dummy variables for the region. You can also see these are negative correlations. It's a little bit green. <laughs> almost looks like the yellow. You can see it more clearly here. Now, normally behavioral metrics have positive correlations between them, which is what you're seeing down here. Here we can see that 
dislikes per month is positively correlated with a, a dislike percent metric and also with the first group of metrics. We can also see that these are positively correlated. So metrics tend to have positive correlations between them, but categories have negative correlations. So that's why you don't group them in the same way. I also mentioned that you shouldn't really be analyzing correlations using this simple correlation coefficient, uh, correlations of dummy variables, but we'll, we'll leave that one aside. The other thing I want you to notice is that in this case, <clears throat> these three are the channel columns. These three actually have some correlations with behaviors. You can see that channel app store two is positively correlated with the metric group two, which was messaging and replying. So that means that people in channel app store two use the message feature more. Oh, and they also have a higher value on this reply per message metric. Whereas the web channel has a higher value of posts, uh, more posts per message. So you can find that demographics may be correlated with your behaviors, which is significant. In fact, that's usually a, a main reason that demographics have a, an impact on churn is actually their correlation with demographics more than uh, anything else. I mean, their correlation with behaviors more than an intrinsic quality of the demographic. All right, so this was answering the question of why not reduce dimension of categories with correlation groups? because they're negatively correlated with each other. So if you want to reduce the dimensions of categories, you group by other means. Okay, so moving along through, we have now combined the metric data with category dummies and we're ready to cross validate. We already saw the cross validation listing earlier. It was 9.5. And now we're gonna run a different version of it. Does anyone out there want to see the, the, the cross validation listing again? Going once, going twice. Do we want to step through cross-validation of a logistic regression model again, or should I just run it? <laughs> Ken Puffy says, just run it. <laughs> All right, let's just run it, then we'll look at the results. That's like the more interesting part. <clears throat> It is running. It took a little bit longer this time. Did you notice that? It was faster the first time when we only had the demographic data. Let's look at the results. So as usual, running the listing, 1.2 seconds the first time. Yeah, well, if you think it's gonna took a long time now, wait until we do XG Boost. <laughs> That's when it gets really fun. I have to tell a joke at that point. So let's see. So we also made a chart of the results of the cross-validation for the new version, including the uh, demographic fields and behavioral fields together. And now you can see that we can actually this is again showing the lower you go on that C parameter variable, the fewer uh, weights and coefficients you have. So, and also eventually it might start hurting your performance. But if you look in this case, the accuracy doesn't really decline at all until around 0 0.04 or 0 0.02. You might say that 0 0.04 is the best. And also, well, you can see we don't lose any more metrics going from 0.04 to 0.02. But we can reduce the number of metrics from 20 down to 12 and have really no impact on the accuracy. So that's what we're seeing uh, from this cross-validation. This says, suggest using the C parameter set to 0.04 for this regression. So, now we're gonna do that. If you hear screaming in the background, that's, I think my kid's playing video games. <laughs> I heard a scream back there. I don't know if that picked up on the mic. Anyway, now we do the cross-validation. Let's analyze the results. Again, back to listing 9.4. 
this time version 5. And these are all pre-saved versions because I'm pretty much just um, you know following along with a book. So four, we'll just do, I'll just change this one to version 5. And I think I'm going to go with the, the, the same decision as on the last one. Let's just run this listing and look at the results because we already looked at how we do uh, a logistic regression. Uh-oh. No, that's not uh-oh. It worked. I thought that was an error message. All right, so what did we get from this regression? We got a new summary um, of the coefficients and the impact. And let's look what happens when we do category variables and the behavioral metrics together. Zooming in again. Here, let me close this old one. That was the correlation matrix we don't need. It's now a distraction. So again, looks like a lot of the categories got zeroed out by the, the cross-validation and using the lower um, value for the C parameter. Again, I'll format these green for good, red for bad, because green contributes to retaining the customer and red contributes to churn of the customer. <clears throat> these columns is the same information as a percentage which I'm formatting for you. So we can see that this, this column here shows you what is in the group for your uh, convenience. So you can see the most, the best things for retaining a customer are messages and replies and having new friends. Also helpful for retaining customers are Hmm, can you choose colors when doing this? Oh, really? Oh, you're red, green, colorblind? I am so sorry. And that's a good point. I should stay off of red, green color differences in my stream to help out people. Let's go um, blue for good and red for bad. I don't know what, what if there's a natural good or bad direction. We think red is kind of churning. Red is like red alert, red alert, churn. So we'll say blue is uh, cool. Glad that's good. And I'm going to try to remember that. I'm really sorry. It actually never occurred to me that use, and I've used that color scheme a lot, but I'm going to remember that. So thank you for bringing that up, Ken Pafu. Okay. So anyway, you can see the worst thing for the customer is seeing a lot of ads, but now where are our categories? What happened to our categories? They're down here, and they almost all have their coefficients set to zero uh, by the regression. Only the channel App Store 1 kept a little bit of a coefficient, a, a little bit of weight from the regression, and it had 0.1% uh, impact on retention. Whereas our most influential variables, metric group 2 and new friend per month had 1.4% impact on retention. Now what happened here? This is actually weird, because if we go back to our other regression, let's go and find our other regression summary. Uh, I guess it was this one, <clears throat> which I will, well, I shouldn't have closed this. I was too quick to close it. The point is when we did this earlier regression, we actually saw a significant weight and, and impact assigned to the channels at least. But in the new regression where we had numeric data, behavioral data, in addition to the category data, the channels got a much lower weight. And the reason has to do with the correlation I showed you between the channel and the behavior. What the regression is telling us is that if you have the behavioral data available, the channel variable is not that significant. Um, but if you don't have behavioral data available, you actually see some significance uh, on the channels. And that has to do with those correlations that I was showing you before. Now this is just a simulation, so this isn't real. You might find in your own product or service that uh, demographic categories do have a strong significance for predicting churn independent of behavior. 
But I crafted the simulation this way because this is actually the most similar to what I see in my real case studies that I've worked on. Usually I see that if you look at demographic data like countries or channels or industries or what have you, if you look at them by themselves, you may see some significant relationship to churn. But very often if you put them in a regression and combine them with behavioral data, all of a sudden the significance for the, the demographics goes away. And so that's what I'm showing here. Uh, again, this might not be exactly the same in your own product or service, but this is what I've mostly found to be true in real case studies. And it's actually a little bit of a confusion for many people in marketing, because people in marketing are very used to thinking in terms of demographic categories, like regions and you know demographic types, and they always want to know about the demographics in churn but they fail to realize that it's usually behavior that is more predictive of churn. So maybe you'll find it different in your own case studies, but anyway, so that now we've cross validated and analyzed the results for logistic regression with category dummies and behavioral data combined. All right. So now going back to our main program, the game plan, we can see that uh, we've done parts one and two, and the last part will be the XGBoost model on combined category dummies plus behavioral data. And we saved a special version of the data for this. Uh, let me show it to you. Well, I'll show it to you in the listing. This is going to be listing 9.6, um, which is the XGBoost cross-validation, which is a great time to chat. If anyone else has good data science topics to chat about, <laughs> we can do it when we're watching the XGBoost cross-validation. All right, here it is. I guess I'll debug this one again because we haven't done this today. Uh, wait, checking by version, version two. Let's find an XGBoost cross-validation or make one. All right, chapter nine, listing six, version three. Damn, did I get all that right? It's hard to keep these all straight. No, version two. That's why I keep checking. Whoops. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen during a stream either. <laughs> One of those days. Well, this is not a bad day for me. A bad day is when everything's crashing. <laughs> so this is a great day on my stream. Nothing's crashed yet. I do think the new version of Streamlabs OBS is more stable. So now we're going to cross-validate an XGBoost model. The first thing we do, as usual, is prepare the data. Let's take a quick look at the data so we can make sure we're working on the right data frame. Now in this one, for XGBoost, we have the metrics unscaled. This is the customer's age, the number of likes per month and the, the natural scale values for all these metrics. Now, why don't we scale them? Because for decision tree based models like XGBoost, you don't need to do a scaling to get the best results. Now, I'm just, I'm using XGBoost here. I should mention, why am I using XGBoost without explaining it? Because it's all in an old stream. About one month ago, I was demonstrating everything about XGBoost that you would hopefully want to know. Now let's just check and make sure, here we go. So here we have the category variables as well. Now it's fine to use dummy variables in XGBoost, of course. Um, and so here they are. So we have one data frame combined with the um, numeric metrics unscaled and also not dimension reduced, mind you. You don't do that for XGBoost either. And the lack of preparation um, is uh, that you need in your data is often why people like using XGBoost. You don't have to do all that prepa prepare data stuff that we did with the um, logistic regression model. Okay, nevertheless, these next steps are the same. We also use a time series split object to control the split. Um, I'm also using the lift. Ah, I wonder if this is gonna work. This is an old version of my code. 
Let's see if this works. I updated my XGBoost library and I also updated it in the code in my repo, but I'm just noticing that I am using an old version here. So these are the parameters we're gonna cross validate for the XGBoost. The maximum depth of the, of the trees, the learning rate that you use to combine the trees, the number of trees to combine, and the minimum weight for each uh, child tree. And I define these in a dictionary and then I again use the grid search CV object. Now here's the moment of truth. I think this might crash. I'm just gonna run it now because I updated XGBoost and I think I have to change some of this. Oh man, it's crashing. All right, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go get the new version of this listing. This is an, I've got an old version of my repo here. So what I'm gonna do, let's see. I am just gonna get the new code real quick. Live hack, live hack. I have another copy of the repo. And I'm basically just gonna do a quick drop of the new code listing in here. You probably won't even notice the difference. What did I change for the new XGBoost? I had to um, add the loss, negative log loss, and add this evaluation metric parameter. And these were changes that I made after the book came out to keep up with the XGBoost uh, package. So let's try running this version. It's really not any different materially. All right, now it's actually running it. And I'm sorry that I didn't have the right version of the listing ready uh, for the stream today. Whoops. Wow, the new version spits out a lot of verbiage. Oof. A lot of warnings in the new version. I think I found a way to suppress that too. Ken Bafu says, you're learning machine learning via Udemy course. I know I have to learn and understand decision tree XGBoost for a hockey expected goal model. But do you think it's good for me to continue on with the course? Hmm, I'm worried about getting through the deep learning section because I don't know any calculus. Hmm, I would say, um, well, XGBoost takes a while to run, and that's a good question while we're <laughs> running the XGBoost cross-validation and it's printing out all these ridiculous warning messages. I do believe this is really working though, so let's just ignore these. <laughs> we'll see in a minute. Now, because you're working on a hockey problem, I would actually say, this is important, Ken Pafu, uh, don't bother with deep learning because no one uses deep learning for problems with structured data. And by structured data, I mean data that's in a table or data frame, you know, like the ones we were looking at. Let's see, did I still have a, a data frame open? If your data set looks anything like this, where you have, you know, measurements and, you know, demographics in the different columns, you don't want to use deep learning. Um, deep learning is most appropriate for images and sound uh, processing like audio recognition or handwriting recognition or also natural language processing. And that's where you want to use deep learning. If you're trying to predict hockey goals, your data is probably structured, you know, like this one. You're saying you have data about your games. Um, yeah, so you're structuring and cleaning up data from the API. You probably have data about your games, like who won and who lost, what the score was, who the starting player was. So for that, you really do want to use XGBoost um, and not another decision tree model. I mean, you could try Random Forest just for the educational value, but XGBoost is pretty much state of the art nowadays. Let's see how the cross-validation is going. Chugging away. 
well. Kind of annoying that. But so, I don't know about the Udemy course. If it's gonna do deep learning, then it's not gonna help you with uh, the hockey problem. Um, XGBoost and Decision Trees will definitely help with that. So I don't know. I mean, the course might be good if you're learning other stuff. I thought I had found a way to suppress this output too. Oh, I have verbose equals one. No, I'm not suppressing the output. Maybe I should have run this with verbose equals zero. Probably. Why did I do verbose equals one? It's printing all this crap. Well, it does take five or 10 more minutes, five or 10 minutes to run the XDBoost cross-validation. And I think as long as it's printing out these weird error messages, I mean, these weird warnings, nothing bad is happening. Okay, the API has coordinate data of where every shot was taken throughout the game. Now that's interesting. That's what I'm working with. I'm working through regression right now. So what, what does the coordinate data of where every shot was taken through the game look like? And how do you convert those into features for your data set? That's it. That sounds like a good, hard feature engineering problem because you have a lot of shots in every game, right? But are, let's see, and what is your outcome for the um, hockey problem? Hmm. So you have XY data for every shot, huh? And you're gonna try to predict, are you trying to predict who's gonna win the game or if a goal is gonna be made? for a given shot. Hey, XG Boost might finally be done. No, not quite. Oh yes, it is done. Whew. What did it say here? Well, 4.7 minutes. 512 different parameter evaluations. Cool. Well, anyway, now we have an XG Boost model trained and the, and the output saved. I'll just show you, you what was saved by that. Whoops, got to go back to my uh, streaming output directory. Let's close this up. We were working on SocialNet 2. So I want to show you what we just did. So this is a histogram of prediction churn probabilities. This is the model in a pickle. We'll use that again in a little bit. And this is a summary of the cross-validation result for XGBoost on this data set. We didn't look at this, but this is similar to the plot that we looked at for the logistic regression. This is saving it out in a table. Each row represents one parameter combination tried by the cross-validation and we have the accuracy of the model and we can find out the best one. So the best model has the highest average AUC and also the highest in the log loss. The parameters of the model were to have only a depth of two. So these are very shallow trees, depth two trees but 120 of them. And so that's our XG boost model fit. Okay, probability of goal going in when shot from that section of the ice. Oh, I see, okay, cool, interesting. Now, there a regression model might be tough because regression models are best when there's like a monotonic relationship between the position and the outcome. So you might get better results, definitely with XG boost or decision tree. All right, so we cross, whoops. Well, we actually did, that is the cross validation. I said, what do we have to do? Cross validate. The XG boost model actually doesn't give you too much insight um, after you've run it, unless you do the shapely analysis, um, which I didn't really prepare. So I showed you tuning the XG boost model and the accuracy. So let's see, we have a few topics left. That does get through all of our analytic tasks. 
The next part was gonna be forecasting for new customers with demographic data, because we have fit the model, um, both a logistic regression model and an XGBoost model. And I was just gonna now show you a few of the things that you have to do when you wanna go make forecasts for new customers. So we have to re-extract the current customer data with categories. By current customer data, I mean your new customers. All this analysis previously so far was done on historical customers. Then we have to re-prepare the catacult data for forecasting. And then we can forecast with regression and forecast with XDBoost. So we've actually got a few listings left to go through. Some of these will be repeats and one of them will be brand new. So, well, two of them will be brand new. First, we're gonna get a new data set uh, of the current customers. This is actually a SQL listing. We'll do one SQL listing today, which is always good. This is good for you to see where the data comes from. I'm just gonna close up all these old ones. All right, so we were gonna run chapter 10, listing six, <clears throat> which is to get the data for new customers. So let's make a configuration for this. Um, I'll just duplicate an old one. Chapter 10, listing six, no version. Now we can't debug this one because it's a SQL. So it, the program is gonna run the SQL and save a file for the result. And I will explain to you a little bit about what it's doing while it's running. When you run it, by the way, it prints out the SQL so you know what you're running. So what is this big SQL that creates the data set? As usual, I went into it in a lot of detail in a previous stream. Like I said, we're almost at the end of the book and we're just adding the categorical demographic data. So we find the, a maximum date and that's the date we're gonna select all the customers for. I also select the account tenure of the customer, which is how long they've been a customer. And we want customers who have been customers for at least 14 days. So that's why I'm doing this. And these are what's called common table expressions, each one of these little expressions within a parentheses. Now this main SQL is what gets the customer data out. So we're getting the account ID, that date, which is the date of observation of the customers. Then we've got our channel and country. And I mentioned earlier that we convert the birth date into a customer age by subtraction, but I didn't demonstrate it to you earlier in the stream. Now you can see how that works. So we do the, the last metric time, which is like the date of this data set analysis, subtract off the date of birth, cast it to float, which is what these double uh, colons do in Postgres, and then divide that by 365. And that's how we get the customer age. The rest of these selects are the trick which takes our data from a, a single column table and puts each metric in its own column of the data set. There's a case statement based on the metric name ID that takes the value only for one metric um, and wrapping that in a sum and then putting this all in a big aggregation results in each column having only one metric. And this is a good trick, very good trick. I covered it in depth in an old stream as usual. Uh, and then down here, this is the join between uh, the account tenure common table expression, the subscription table, the account table, and of course, uh, the metric table, where we get all those behavioral metrics. And then we are doing a group by uh, for the purpose. It's not a true group by. We're not, it's kind of a cheating aggregation. It's a selection aggregation, which is this some case when trick, which I call that the data flattening trick, because making a data set is also known as flattening a data set. Okay, so probability, so 
So you meant you're currently learning regression in the course and the next section in the course is classification. Okay, that's good. You want classification, but this was mostly a conversation while we waited for XG boost. Yeah, that was a good conversation. <laughs> All right, so this is our data set running SQL and it has run, it should have run by now. And it saved me a new file. And I call this the current data set because these are the current customers. And that will have appeared right up here. If you can see this. Um, so this actually looks a lot like our original data set, really. I'll open it up to show you a quick look. Except the original data set, remember, had an indicator for who churned and who didn't churn. We don't have that anymore because these are like currently live customers. This is, well, it's actually, if this is saying this, pretend this is a year ago, which is when I made the simulation for the book. It's 2021 now. So this is one year ago. Pretend it was one year ago and you were running this analysis. This is what your new data set would look like. All right. So the next part is we're gonna prepare the current data for forecasting. And there's one important step here, which is the last really significant new material in today's stream, is alignment of historical and current categories, which we're gonna do next in this rescoring uh, function. It's basically the last new listing in the book, I think. This is also a Python listing. So rescoring means to re-prepare the data. And I did also have, as usual, um, a long stream on um, rescoring data for forecasting. So this is now chapter 10, listing seven. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna redo all those processes that we did in, in the previous listings of creating the dummy variables from the categories, and then also dimension reducing the data using a loading matrix and turning the metrics into scores, actually in the reverse order. So we're gonna have to redo all those things, and we're actually gonna reuse the old listings, which we've, all, we've seen all of these by now. So we've included the dummy variable listing and also that old rescore metrics listing. So first I call the dummy variable function, which we saw earlier in the stream. Oh, still have the breakpoint. <clears throat> well, if you missed this earlier in the stream, this basically results in us calling the get dummies function from pandas. And that's how we get our dummy variables from the analysis. So I just stepped out of that one. Uh, next, we're going to reload uh, the current dummies. And now we're gonna do the very interesting thing I was telling you about, or very important, I don't know if it qualifies as interesting, which I call aligning the dummies. <clears throat> and let's take a look. So aligning your dummy variables is what you have to do when you have an old data set with categories and then a new data set with categories. And the problems that can happen is, what if you have a category in your old data set that's not in your new data set? or a category in your new data set that's not in your old data set. The problem is that the prediction algorithms like logistic regression and XGBoost, both of them do this, they assign a particular meaning to each column. So you need to have your columns have exactly the same order and the same meaning in both the old and the new data sets. But when we called the the function to make the dummy variables, it only works on the categories that are currently in the data set. So you actually have to check and make sure that your new data has all the categories the same as the old data. Um, and if it doesn't, you have to put in a column of zeros to represent the missing category. Similarly, or vice versa, if your new data has a category that's not in the old data, you just have to drop it because the new data has to have exactly the same columns in exactly the same order as when you fit the, the regression in XGBoost, or this just doesn't make any sense. You'll just get an error. So I load the current data um, and I make a set of the uh, new 
dummy variables. And in this case, let's take a look at what I got. So it looks like in this case, we have all the, the categories. Um, we have country groups and the three channels. So the truth is this is kind of an exercise that you don't really have to do for the social network data set, I don't think. But it's good to know how to do it because in your own data, you might not have this. In fact, just last week, I was fixing a bug at work where it was actually a unit test where the model that was fit expected a certain number of columns, but the unit test didn't have all the same categories as the original data set. So I had to use a technique like the one I'm showing you right now. Uh, that was in my day job. So now we see what the old dummies are. And now we do set differences to find out what dummies are missing in the old data or missing in the new data. And in this case, because my sample data set is so nice, you're not actually missing any. So maybe I should have made a better example for this, but I wanted to show you everyone the code for how to do this, even if you don't actually have to do it in this particular data set. So for data that we're missing in the new, like I said, we would create, for a category that was missing in the new, we would create the column and set it all to zeros. Similarly, for a category that was not in the old historical data, we drop it. And that's really um, everything in this listing. Well, in that part. Um, the other things we do in the rest of this is saving off those different versions of the data set. So remember how for the regression, we need the data that has the scaled metrics uh, and dimension reduced data. And for XGBoost, we don't dimension reduce and we don't scale. So this is just saving out those different versions. Um, particularly, it's redoing the loading matrix transformation. So I reloaded the loading matrix, which I use for dimension reduction from, and that's what this looks like. I showed this earlier in the stream. So there's my loading matrix. Uh, now I'm reloading churn data, reloading the current data without categories. Now here, this is important. I'm making sure that the indices are the same um, in my different data sets. And now, and that checks out too. Um, this is redoing the, the scoring or the normalization of the metrics. And again, transforming skewed and fat tails columns were things I went over in detail in the earlier listings. Um, and then this is the part where we use the loading matrix to dimension reduce the data. And then finally, we save the different versions of the data for XGBoost and regression. So as a result of that listing, I now have my current data, um, the XGBoost version and the regular version. Let's see where we should anyway. Yeah, here's the one with the XGBoost data uh, for the current data. I don't know if I really need to show you all these data sets at, at this point. So this is for forecasting XGBoost once again. No scaling of metrics, no dimension reduction, category uh, dummy variables. And we have a similar version for log logistic regression. I won't bother saving you that. Let's go on to the forecasting part. What's next? Forecast with regression. Listing 8.5, version two. Now we're using a saved model now. This is the cross-validated regression model we saved earlier. So I will go in and show you this one going to be, let's see, um, C parameter, wait a second, what did it say it was? I said it's 8.5 version 2, hmm. all right, I'm not sure if that's right, but I really thought I just did this, so I'm looking for my old listing. 
rather than just creating uh, more and more. All right, here's 8.5 version two. And we'll look at how we do forecasting with a saved model for a regression. And this should be the data with the X that we saved for the dummy variables. So I have a data set path, which should be the new one that I made, data set three. And then the pickle path is derived from that. So, okay, I check that my pickle is there and then I load it. And now I have a logistic regression model object. If I look at this log reg model variable, you can see, well, that doesn't show you too much. But if we do it this way, there. So you can see these are, this is my model from before. Uh, somewhere in here, I could even find those coefficients. Here we are. This is all what we had before, what we saved before. Now, to do the predictions, I just uh, load up my data set, and this is, should be my new data set, which has the dimension reduced metrics, yep, and the dummy variables, yep. And then I just uh, do the predictions by calling predict proba. That's actually it. Now the predictions is a big data frame of the churn probability and also the retention probability for every customer. So on the left is the churn probability, that's the low number. And on the right is the uh, retention probability. So that's a higher number. All right, so that's how you reforecast on the saved, uh, with a saved model. And we also saved out the forecasts. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details. We save out a histogram too, which I explained in a previous stream also. We can look at that in just a minute. Well, let's look at it right now, actually. So this is my histogram that I just created of the churn probabilities. And yeah, so there's not really too much to it. Once the hard part is re-preparing your data, really. Calling the forecasting function is easy. So the only thing left is to forecast with XGBoost. And that is listing 9.7 version two. So I'll have to make a new configuration again. I said nine, chapter nine. And again, we went through this in detail when I did XGBoost. So I'm just gonna show it briefly again. So I'll have covered all the code. In the chapter, which is chapter 10. So to churn forecast with an XGBoost model, it's similar. We're gonna reload a pickle again. And that's our model. This one, did you notice it took a moment to load there? It took a little bit longer. And if we look at the XGBoost model, well, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, we're not gonna get into the details of this either. And I'm probably not even the most qualified person to explain all this to you in full honesty. All right, so then once again, we reload um, the current data, which means current customers. And again, this time we have their natural scale metrics, uh, no dimension reduction, and we have the category variables. Yeah, and then pr to predict, you again call the predict proba function uh, of the sklearn model. Predict proba is a very useful function to know because it gives you the probability of an outcome, not just whether the outcome is gonna be true or false. So for example, uh, for the hockey goal model, you would probably want to use this to get the probability of a shot going in. Now, once again, we're going to save the forecast. The forecasts actually look exactly the same. 
I don't know if I should bother. It's even worth showing to you again. But we have the retention probability and the churn probability. Although actually I'm noticing they're in different order for XG boost. I think they, they had their, their, the order swapped. They couldn't be consistent. And also we're gonna save a forecast histogram. This was the old forecast histogram from the regression model. And we should have another new one from the XG boost model. They're actually very similar because the truth is um, these are both pretty accurate models. If you read through the stuff in fighting churn with data, the XG boost model is only a few percent more accurate than the logistic regression. So they make a very similar quality of predictions. But okay, I think I've done it. I think I did everything that was on the to-do list. Yes, this ends the to-do list, forecasting with XG boost. And I will add that this is a, oh, flow swap, thanks for following. Welcome to the data science and fighting churn with data hangout spot. Hope you can join us back sometime. Um, this is a very special moment though, because I have just completely streamed all the code in my book. That was the last code example from the book. And if you look at my old streams, I started at the beginning and I made it to the very end. If you missed at the beginning, this is the book that I'm talking about. So this is what all those uh, code listings have been from. But yeah, like I said, for this is a big milestone, hooray. I just streamed my entire book from cover to cover. How about that? And the summary of what I streamed today is that fighting churn is about targeted invention, targeted interventions, <laughs> not inventions. Maybe inventions would help fighting churn, <laughs> but really churn is about targeted interventions, like improving your product, uh, engaging with your customers, supporting them more, and improving your pricing. Demographics and firmographics, what we were talking about today, they're facts about people and companies, respectively. And by facts, I mean unchanging facts, which is different from behavioral me measurements, which we often use in churn analysis. To use predictive algorithms, you convert the categories in your demographics to binaries. And it's called a dummy variable, also known as one hot encoding. I prefer dummy variables because it goes back to uh, Bool in the 19th century, it's the original name. Now, do not dimension reduce categories by correlation methods. I showed that in the stream today too because categories always have a negative correlation with other categories from the same field due to the mutually exclusive property of the categories. Demographics are usually less predictive of churn than behavior. I mean, that's kind of like the take home message of what I was showing you today. You can do all this work to get your categories into your prediction data set, but the truth is it usually doesn't help the predictions that much. They only have a little bit of weak significance, but they can contribute a little bit of extra lift. So if you really want the highest accuracy for your model, you should use the, the dummy variables. I didn't actually show that. Maybe we could real quick look at the difference in the accuracy. Does anyone want to see that on the, on the chat? Let's see if I can go to the XG boost model. So we looked, we were just looking at the XG boost cross validation. And we saw that when I did it with the dummy variables, the highest cross validation lift or, at, or AUC was 0.7965. Now I'm gonna go try to find the old version of this without the dummies. That would be in data set two. I gotta dig back in here. Let's see, let me know if you see it. <laughs> Let's search in this folder. You might hear my dog barking in the background and I apologize for that. <laughs> 
So let's see. Here's the cross validation of data set three, data set two. Hey, it looks like I don't have a, a cross validation. Oh God, I have it in some other folder. Wow. I'm gonna have to go find my other folder to, to demonstrate this. Hold on one second. I'm a man of my words and I'm gonna show you how much difference it made in the forecasting accuracy. Let's see. I guess I didn't do it in this particular schema or version of the schema. All right, now here is the cross-validation version. Uh, same data set, but without the categories. That's data set two in the notation here. And here, the mean accuracy, oh shoot, it was higher. <laughs> it was 0.8. <laughs> well, that makes my point that including the categories does not necessarily contribute much to your accuracy. Seems to have even hurt the accuracy a little bit. Well, 0.7965 to 0.8025. So a very small difference in the accuracy. Uh, so it seems that in this case, maybe the category variables just led to overfitting in the, in the, in the cross validation, in the XGBoost model. So that was my point that demographics usually don't help that much. All right, so that was the summary of today's stream along with one little last dive into the weeds. Now I'll just let you know my live stream schedule is Saturday afternoons. It's my only streaming time nowadays. Uh, I started a new job at a startup and I'm real busy in my day job. Um, for my day job, I'm a data science team manager at a startup called Migo.money. Um, Ken Palfu asks, if I came across this in practice, would I stick with the first one? Yeah, I definitely would. I mean, I, yeah, if, if you do something, if you add demographics to your data set, you definitely want to check if it actually makes an increase in the predictive accuracy or not. And you notice it didn't really hurt the predictive accuracy much either, because the XGBoost model is just very powerful. If you put irrelevant data into an XGBoost model, it actually won't make that much difference is the truth. So now you actually got me a good question. Would I really bother to remove them? Because you can put a lot of useless data into an XGBoost model and it usually doesn't hurt it. Um, but if you know some data is useless, it's better just to remove it. So I don't know. Yep, so I stream on Saturdays. And I don't know if I'll be back next Saturday. I think I'm going to take a little vacation, actually. And you can also find all these same videos on demand on YouTube sometime after I have uh, made them. <laughs> if you're into YouTube, I don't know. You're all here watching me on Twitch right now. So you're not the people who are going to be like, you know, watching this on YouTube. But maybe some of your friends who only watch YouTube and not Twitch. Yeah, different strokes for different folks. Do I have a Discord for a community discussion? You know what? I've been thinking about doing that, and I really should, but I haven't done it yet. Um, it's really on my to-do list, uh, and I just, uh, yeah, I just haven't taken the time to do it. I'm also a little bit intimidated, like, that I have to moderate and stuff like that. I have to set up the rules and make sure that no one's violating my rules and stuff, so... It's just tough because I, I, I mentioned I have a pretty demanding day job these days. But I will try to do a Discord channel. Um, once again, this is all based on a book, uh, Fighting Turing with Data, that I wrote. Came out about mm, six months ago now. And there's a discount code you can use here if you buy the book from my publisher. Yeah, no, I think it would be a good idea. And I'd like to have a way to interact with people who are interested in churn and interested in this code. Um, also, if you want to interact with me, uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow me for updates. Don't worry. I don't really tweet about my personal life or the food that I eat. I keep it pretty much it's about churn and data science is mostly all you're going to hear if you follow me on, on Twitter. Um, yeah, or LinkedIn also. So, whoops. 
I think that's it for today. My next stream is going to be about a new customer simulation. So if you want to learn more about how I do the customer simulation and maybe make your own simulation of churn data, I'm going to be working on making a new and improved churn simulation uh, to make lots of great new data for further analysis uh, in other streams. And I'm going to take a vacation, so most likely my next stream will be Saturday, June 5th. I'm going to have two weekends off in a row. And sorry for the slow pace of streaming, but you know, things to do, places to go, people to see. Uh, my dad's visiting me next, you know, next weekend. So definitely next weekend is out. And the weekend after that is the holiday weekend here in the U.S. So, so yeah, that's really it. Does anyone have any final questions or things you want to talk about on the stream? And if not, we could do a raid. We could look for some... Uh,